Okay. Um, the subject today is model-based systems engineering, um, and specifically an approach to doing model-based systems engineering uh, using a methodology and framework that I've been working on for uh, the best part of 30 years now, which is which I called model-based system architecture process. The name doesn't have any particular significance. It's just nobody else was using it, and I needed the name, <laughs> so I took it. Um, it. It used to be uh, popular when proposing a significant change to an established process or methodology to state the case for why the change was needed. And we, we used to call that a burning platform. And my burning platform is that legacy systems engineering no longer meets the needs of modern high technology complex systems and systems of systems. We need something better. And model-based engineering in general and model-based systems engineering in particular is currently the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm sure everybody listening here is familiar with the, the, the problems that we face. Ever-growing com complexity, ever-growing uh, interaction over networks, uh, more and more dependence on information, how it's gathered, processed, disseminated, and so on. Uh, program after program experiencing cost and schedule overruns uh, to go with performance shortfalls and reliability problems. And then to cap it all off, the fact that we keep our systems around for so long creates endless logistics nightmares with technology obsolescence and changing requirements and the need to sustain and upgrade over the long term. Now, I think it is fair to say across the community now that a more robust and effective system engineering process is absolutely essential. And I'm gonna argue and try to show you why today that a model-based approach, uh, sometimes called digital engineering, uh, you'll hear, hear terms like digital twin, for example, uh, which includes model-based systems engineering as a specific uh, category, is the current best practice that we have. So my message today really has these two points. First, I am convinced, and I've got a lot of experience to support my convictions, uh, that MBSE does provide higher productivity, higher quality, uh, better use of resources, overall better tools and processes, for doing the things the systems engineers have been doing for at least three quarters of a century. This is not reinventing systems engineering. This is doing systems engineering in a better tool and process environment so that we can do it better. So that's point one. But point two, and I'm not gonna say much more about this, but I wanna plant the seed in your minds. My experience has been that, that effecting a transition from legacy system engineering to, to model-based is at least as much, sometimes more, of a cultural challenge than it is a technical challenge. And I've concluded the reason why that is so is that so many middle level and senior engineers uh, are simply unable to accept the reality that their skills are obsolete, that the world has changed, that needs and tools and processes have changed, and so they resist uh, making a fundamental change. There's, there are way too many systems engineers out there who think the supreme system engineering tool is an Excel spreadsheet. And that is simply no longer the case. So what I'm gonna do is talk about these three things. Um, you might, if you looked at the file in advance, you saw a pretty large count of slides. Don't, don't be intimidated. Most of those in the last topic are examples out of a model. And in general, I'm gonna put up a diagram or, or other uh, screen and uh, make a couple of key points about it. I do intend to finish promptly. Um, if we get a lot of questions and a good discussion going, then perhaps for those who can stay, we can run a little over time. But my goal is to, is to get this done by um, 1230 your time. All right, let's begin with what are we talking about? What is this MBSE thing? I, I still encounter people who think it's something new and faddish and unproven and immature. Um, and so I think starting with a little bit of historical context, uh, you can find writings in the literature that trace the origins of system engineering all the way back to the first telephone systems in the early 20th century. But it really got its start just before and during World War II. Uh, and a good example was the B-29, which was the first weapon system developed during World War II that was complex enough and had a, uh, enough of a sprawling collection of contractors and facilities and so on to require something that today we would call a system program office. Um, so that's about where I would argue modern systems engineering begins. In the 50s and 60s, we began to refine system engineering methodologies 
in areas like requirements, P and V, uh, requirements allocation and traceability, especially a big one was configuration management, but also interface control and so on. And there's a very good book called The Secret to Apollo uh, that makes a compelling case that the reason the Project Apollo succeeded in putting a man on the moon and others, including the European programs, didn't was that they applied this first generation of rigorous systems engineering. And in the 60s and 70s, the software community uh, was having increasing difficulty uh, delivering software that worked and was bug free and so forth. Uh, and a concept uh, that, that came to be called structured programming emerged. Um, early languages like COBOL and Lisp and especially Pascal were popular. And that in turn led to what we today call object-oriented design, uh, AOD. Um, the three amigos, Grady Booch, Jim Rumbaugh, and Ivar Jakobsen, uh, kind of led the charge to develop uh, what, uh, what today we call the unified modeling language, um, which was the, the uh, formal rigorous mathematical uh, capture and instantiation of the concepts of object-oriented design. DOD took a swing at it with ADA, uh, Ada was designed by a committee, and um, you've probably heard the old story that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Um, and Ada, by and large, was not successful, partly because of the, the language itself and partly because DOD refused to follow through on the implementing, on the money for implementing steps such as a compiler verification package. Well, anyway, about a decade or, or 15 years later, um, the Unified Modeling Language was formally adopted and published by the Object Management Group. And about a decade after that, a group of systems engineers began to seriously discuss whether object orientation could benefit systems engineering in general in the same sorts of ways that it was benefiting software engineering. OMG put out a request for information, and that led to the first version of the Systems Modeling Language, SysML. So it's been updated several times and it is now very well supported by very mature and capable tools. My, <clears throat> my point here is that, that MBSE is just the next step in a logical progression. It's not something that uh, was delivered by a space alien uh, one afternoon and, uh, and nobody knows what it is. Here is what it is in one slide. If I take the left side first, we usually begin with some kind of complex and especially information intensive system or enterprise system of systems. We take that complex entity and we capture it in a formal architecture model complying with the SysML language standard. And what we get from that is a complete and most importantly, unambiguous representation. And then the, the products that we can generate from or export from such a model provide the materials on which a consistent metrics managed, high quality, high productivity systems engineering process can be built. And some specifics of that, the bumper sticker that you see all the time is that MBSE means replacing legacy document centric processes with model centric processes. We replace uh, file rooms full of filing cabinets full of paper with an a rigorously managed model that can be shared by everyone with the appropriate permissions. It's important to establish an integrated tool environment. We would love for MBSE to be tool agnostic. Uh, it's not yet possible. The tool vendors are not interested. That's not in their economic interest. And so today, um, to have an efficient MBSE process as a realistic uh, proposition, you have to pick a set of tools and integrate them in, a, in an environment. Once we have that, we can then capture, analyze, document, and very importantly, evolve over time. And there is a process that I, that I teach in my classes and, and, and documented in the book called, called the quality attributes that can be used to control the technical integrity of an architecture over time. And once we've done all of that, we use the model and the stuff we get out of the model to do better requirements, better specifications, uh, better uh, management, better project planning and management to support a wide range of trade studies, to do configuration management much more cost effectively and much more rigorously than we could the old days, and to support planning and execution of integration and test. We, we want to integrate all of our key pro program or project 
processes, including specialty engineering and all of the project stakeholders in a collaborative environment where efficient, unambiguous information exchanges can take place. We'll support networking and enterprises. We'll use the model as the basis for metrics and the vitally important aspect of governance. And then we use it over the very long term to support those, uh, those long-term upgrades, technology refreshments, and so on that our older systems are, are confronted with. So that, that's MBSE in a nutshell. And here <coughs> excuse me, is the same idea laid out uh, in the side-by-side -side comparison of legacy and MBSE. Um, a whole lot of studies have been done over the years of why programs get into trouble. Why do, they have, why do we have these cost and schedule overruns? Why are requirements not stable? And those studies tend to produce very similar lists of root causes, and those lists tend to look a lot like this. So if we rock, walk down them, one of the most commonly cited is bad requirements engineering. I'm going to show you very briefly uh, that SysML gives us a means of doing requirements, definition, allocation, traceability, and such that's better than we have ever had before. Anybody who thinks you can do good requirements engineering in a DOORS database is living in the Stone Age. Uh, I mentioned before that we have poor, a poor track record of commonality and reuse. Well, with MBSE and models, we can archive the models, we can derive and apply design patterns, and in that fashion, we can reuse both designs and products in comparable applications that have been proven to work. Uh, integration and test is a constant problem. I invite you to look at the, at the history of the James Webb Space Telescope for what happens when you don't do good requirement or good um, system engineering in dealing with your integration and test program. Well, once again, MBSE doesn't solve the problem, but it gives us powerful tools such as formally documented test cases. Software and hardware problems, uh, MBSE is absolutely indispensable if you're going to do any kind of agile, including agile systems engineering. Um, it is object oriented, which means we get the benefits of abstraction and modularity and generalization and polymorphism and all of the rest of the, of the uh, OOD theory. It turns out to be perfectly suited to software uh, DevSecOps development in a, in, with security and operational participation and on and on and on. Uh, there's a there's a key feature of MBSAP that I'm going to show you in a moment, which involves separating functional architecture from physical architecture, and that turns out to be key to eliminating reverse engineering. If I have to to go back and replace a part that's no longer available or upgrade to a technology uh, that is currently supported and so on, I don't start from scratch and I don't reverse engineer the blueprints. I go back to the functional architecture, find the the model description of the appropriate items and forward engineer from there. And in the process, I can do things like auto-generate specifications and other documents, create ICDs, and, um, and many, many other productivity enhancing features. Um, legacy engineering has another poor track record, and that's for interoperability and robust networking. And the, the folks that are trying to do uh, joint all domain command and control today across DOD are, are facing that squarely. The fact, for example, that today, even today, the F-22 and the F-35 don't have a compatible um, data link. Well, with MBSE, we get powerful support for selecting and applying standards, for managing interfaces, and for doing the performance analysis that tells us when the overhead associated with interoperability begins to impact our operational capability. Legacy has traditionally delivered closed systems. With MBSE, we can enforce principles of modularity, loose coupling, standards compliance, and all the other things that deliver genuinely open architectures, which of course now is a key theme right across the Department of Defense. And when we talk the long-term, uh, life cycle sustainment and modernization are strongly supported by the architecture model that was developed as the system was developed, always providing that model has been maintained. Okay, first, first pause, are there any questions? All righty. Then on to MBSAP. And I am gonna spend a couple of minutes on this chart because it's really kind of the heart of my argument. Um, in the center of the chart is this flow, starting with capabilities, proceeding through a series of viewpoints, 
culminating in a system build and an integration and test process. And then potentially, if I'm doing any kind of spiral or agile development methodology, going back to the capabilities database, selecting another group of requirements and going around the circle again. Um, the, the idea here is that I start with whatever information I have about what the stakeholders want and need. Sometimes it's a formal specification, sometimes it's an industry day briefing, uh, sometimes it's a, a requirements baseline, perhaps in something like doors. But whatever I know about what the stakeholders want is, is the capabilities database. Now, three successive viewpoints. The operational viewpoint is the view of the operator. What this does is take those requirements and translate them into the initial version of an architecture model, uh, doing the top level partitioning into functional and behavioral categories, mapping requirements to those categories. So requirements traceability begins on day one. Uh, we begin to discover services, even if it's not a full-fledged service-oriented architecture, which increasingly our systems do use, I can still, at this stage of the game, do really good work identifying both internal and external services, allocating them to these structural partitions called domains. And another very important point, I begin to develop my data model. A very common mistake for a half a century now has been to treat, to treat the data arch architecture, the data model, um, as that comes later. It's always a mistake and it always wastes a lot of time and money. We begin developing a conceptual data model at a very high level of abstraction at the same time that we're creating the high level architecture. All right, the blue arrows represent transitions. From the operational viewpoint, we transition to a logical functional viewpoint. Now I'm doing design. And I do that design in large part by decomposing the high level elements of the operational viewpoint into more specific until I get down to the level of actual configuration items, actual hardware and software components. But very importantly at this point, I rigorously keep this viewpoint technology independent and product independent, agnostic. This is functional system design. And this is what I'm talking about when I say that if I have to do something to a fielded system, usually I come back to here and forward engineer the new physical elements and then integrate them into the existing system. And I can do that far more effectively than the old days when we had to do reverse engineering. Uh, we continue to develop behavioral and structural elements, and this is where use cases come into existence. Uh, we take the conceptual data model and make it into a logical data model. We flesh out any services that we have discovered, and we define a layered architecture when that is appropriate. Finally, we transition to a physical viewpoint. This is where we actually build the thing. Um, this is where we finish our design and performance trade studies. Uh, we select products to implement the various logical elements. Uh, we develop a standards profile and we take the logical data model and capture it in the appropriate uh, uh, tools to make it a physical data model. Um, and this is, this is the, the uh, physical prototype, typically. Um, once I've defined this, I can build it by either developing or procuring the necessary elements to, to make up the system. I integrate and test those, and then I either deliver, if I'm doing this all in one, one pass, or if I'm doing it in a more agile or spiral methodology, I go back, select a new group of capabilities and do it again. One more key point is here in the middle, the system prototype. See the little red arrows. What they're intended to convey is that every step of this cycle of architecture and system development interacts with a prototype. And the prototype is divided into two flavors. There is a physical prototype that might, for example, an airplane or other vehicle, that might be a system integration lab, a SIL. Um, it might be a, an iron bird. It, there's lots of forms it could take, but this is an actual physical prototype. And I suspect we all know what that means and looks like. The new thought here is there's a virtual prototype. We're gonna talk on the next slide about modeling and simulation. But here's, here's where I wanna make this point. If I build up a virtual prototype, I can calibrate it with data that is measured on the physical prototype. In other words, I can validate that my simulations are good by comparing them to measurements. And on the other hand, I can use the, virt the virtual prototype to explore a wider range of design and operational possibilities than I could possibly afford to do with a, 
with a, a, a physical prototype. Okay, so those are the key elements of MBSAP. It only takes me about 500 pages in the book to describe them in, in detail. Uh, I want to make a couple more key points, and then we'll get on to the to the worked example that I hope will um, will give you a, a good sense of what this MBSA what this MBSAP model based system engineering methodology actually looks like. First point I want to make is system engineering is systems engineering is systems engineering. We've been doing it for a long time and we're still doing fundamentally the same things, starting with defining our requirements and de decomposing and analyzing them, proceeding to allocate them to the elements of the system, either developing or, or uh, per procuring um, the, those components. And then we start up the other side of the V where we integrate and test first at the component level, then at the subsystem level, then at the system level, and sometimes today, uh, all the way up to a system of systems or enterprise level. Um, and there are linkages back and forth between the two sides of the V. Now, here's my point. Those three viewpoints, the operational, logical, functional, and physical, map absolutely naturally to the flow of activities down the left side of the V, and the build, integrate, and test processes are the right-hand side of the V. Now, we may need to use a variety of tools. Specialty engineers always have their favorite tools for, for implementing their piece of the system. Um, but, but even when that's the case, the SysML model is the root of the system engineering environment. It's where the, the, uh, the information resides. It's where the key products are generated. And I, there's a term that's become popular that I like very much single source of technical truth, SSTT. The model is the SSTT for the system. Sometimes I, I call it the, the yellow pages, but it's where you go to find something, to find a piece of data, to find a, an aspect of a design, to find an, an interface uh, definition, whatever. Uh, the model is, is the, the information heart of the system and of the system development program. I talked about simulations and Sometimes these are called executables. And we do this at four levels of abstraction and apply them to the three system viewpoints. With the operational viewpoint, we have, have one level of, of abstraction of our simulations uh, that's called operational. And this can be a war game, or it can be a tool like, um, like system test kit that's used to do orbital analysis, or any of a lot of, 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 of operational kinds of simulations and analyses. One level of, of fidelity down from that is a level that I call process or workflow. This might be a war game. This is kind of like a uh, business process modeling language uh, diagram of a flow of activity through a set of notional components, okay? But, but these, these are the top two levels of my virtual product. By the time I get to building my SysML model, I um, can, can actually simulate the behavior diagrams of the model. Frequently, I can do that inside the modeling tool itself. Sometimes there's more uh, detailed or, or mathematically complex uh, simulation that's required, and I link in an external solver like MATLAB. Finally, when I get to the physical viewpoint, it's impossible to make a generalization because depending on the nature of the system, there are hundreds of physical models, network models, um, strength of materials models radio frequency propagation models, you name it. This one happens to be a snapshot of a, of a network model. But uh, I'll, I will leave you just with the thought that uh, these four levels, and they're listed here with, with a couple of words about their nature, these four levels uh, are not always all implemented, but if they are rigorously done, uh, that is where I get my, the virtual half of my system prototype. One last slide in this introduction, and I'm not going to brief it. It's way too complicated for the time we have, but I want to make a key point. What's on here, if you, if you will follow my laser pointer around this layer or ring, you will see a pretty classic systems engineering flow, starting with needs analysis, defining requirements, defining a concept, coming up with specifications, doing de uh, preliminary and detailed design, uh, proceeding through the prototyping phase, completing an integration and test program, 
publishing my product specifications, and then building, fielding, and sustaining the system. Okay. Well, the orange arrows point from a representation of my architecture model and some of its artifacts. Okay. And the the orange arrows are intended to indicate that at every single stage of this systems engineering flow, there is a two-way interaction. Updates are made to the model as decisions get made, and information is exported from the model to generate the appropriate materials at each stage. So the, this is really what I mean when I say what I've said a couple of times, that the model is at the heart of the systems engineering process and indeed at the heart of the entire development program. Okay, for our final half hour, I'm gonna do a, a worked example. Now I've learned over time that, that this can be dangerous. Uh, when talking to a particular audience with a particular set of interests, if you pick the wrong model, pick the wrong thing to, mo thing to model, um, you can turn the audience off. So uh, what I decided to do for sessions like this <clears throat> is to invent a realistic but completely artificial example. And what I settled on was a microwave oven. Hopefully that's not controversial. Uh, here's a picture of one out of a catalog. It's, this isn't what I modeled. I don't have any data on, on, on any particular microwave oven. I made it all up. But it has enough complexity to show the principles while being simple enough not to drown you in details. So we're going we're gonna to see what MBSAP and a SysML model built using MBSAP looks like. And we're going to start where you should start. We're going to start with requirements. Uh, this set of diagrams, you heard me say that to do this, at, sooner or later, you have to pick a tool. Um, and the tool that we use at Colorado State and the tool that NASA has adopted uh, is Cameo Systems Modeler from, um, from Magic. Uh, it used to be called Magic Draw. Uh, it's now uh, part of Dassault System. And so I think it's actually now supported by Boeing. But anyhow, it's, it's my favorite. Um, I campaigned for it. And here is what a typical uh, screen looks like in Cameo Systems Model. You've got the usual kinds of tools across the top. This pane of the, of the window uh, is called the containment tree. Uh, a lot of tools would call it the browser. This is where you find stuff. And if you build your model correctly, and this organizational structure of packages has resulted from many, many experiments with alternative ways of organizing. Uh, you get a very browsable model that's easy to navigate, easy to find things in. There are other ways to display it, such as diagrams. And over here on this side is a diagram building pane. And depending on the type of diagram that I'm building, the tool automatically puts up a, a tool palette with the appropriate elements, the appropriate model elements for building that kind of diagram. So I'm building a requirements diagram. There's a set of universal tools, and then there's a set of tools that are appropriate to a requirements diagram. Now what this has, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain a few things on this diagram because they are features that are common right across a, any SysML diagram. First of all, it, there has to be a, a diagram frame. That's optional in UML, but it's mandatory in SysML. And that has a, a, a label, has a, a header. The REQ part tells me what kind of diagram it is. And the other three tell me uh, fundamentally uh, what, where it, it falls, where it lies in the model structure. So if I went looking uh, level of indenture by level of indenture down through the browser, I would come across these kinds of, of content. All right, now let's look at this rectangle. The rectangle is the system L symbol for a block, and a block is a fundamental structural element. However, this is a very special block identified by what's called a stereotype. Anytime you see a word between the double angled brackets, which are called DMAs, um, you know that you're, you're uh, looking at a stereotype, and it tells you something about the nature of the block. So later on, we're going to see things like an interface block a test case block. There are lots of specialties and you can define your own. But anyhow, this is a block that represents requirements for 
a microwave oven. Here is a, a compartment within the block, which is labeled satisfied by. And what this tells me is the requirements for the microwave oven are met by a, another block, which is a, actually is a structural block, identified as block and at the level of a system, also called microwave oven. So this tells me that these requirements are going to be satisfied by this system. I then am able to assign a unique identifier and a summary text. Okay, I kept it simple. I'm sure you folks have seen, as I have, uh, system specifications with 2,500 shell statements in them. And you can handle them just fine in a series of requirement diagrams, okay? Uh, but, but obviously we can't do that in, a, in an hour demonstration. So I kept it down to just three at the next level of indenture. Generate radio frequency power, control the cooking process, and implement the necessary safety features on the enclosure. Uh, each of these is a block. Now it's not a system level, it's a domain level. So this is the first level of decomposition structurally. Um, it has identifies the uh, elements of the system that are allocated those requirements, that are responsible for satisfying those requirements, has a unique ID, and again, a summary text. But now here's another really neat feature. Down here at the bottom of the diagram, there are some other rectangles, and they are stereotyped test case. That is defined in SysML as a singular verification method. It can be a test, it can be an analysis, it can be a demonstration, it can be an inspection. Any of the, any of the allowed uh, verification methods can be documented in a test case. But here's the magic. It's this little dashed arrow stereotyped verify. This is how I declare in the model that these requirements will be verified by executing a test case called verify RF power. So in one diagram, I've begun to decompose my requirements. I've uniquely numbered them. I've summarized what their content is, and I have formally linked them to verification methods. That's a lot of power in one diagram. And similarly over here for, for the other two decomposed requirements. The last thing to notice is this funky little arrowhead, believe it or not, that's what it is, an arrowhead consisting of a circle with a cross in it. That is the containment relationship arrow. And that says that each of these three requirements is contained in the higher level requirement. So this is how in SysML, we do and document and visualize requirements decomposition along with requirements verification and requirements allocation to elements of the system. Lots of information very compactly captured and shown. I can show it in a number of ways. Once I've got the requirements in the, in the table, the tool allows me to display them, I, I'm sorry, in the model, the tool allows me to display them as a table. And with three, I think it is mouse clicks, I can export this as an Excel spreadsheet if that's what you insist on having. Uh, I can edit the text here. Sometimes the, the table is a, is a more convenient place to uh, update uh, the description of a block. Um, but here's the same, exact same information except in tabular format. And these kinds of tables are available for all sorts of uh, content in the model. Here's another one. This is a matrix rather than a table, but I can summon this up if I want a brief summary of requirements allocation. So every structural, because of the way I define the scope, every structural element in the model, every block, is listed. And all four of the requirements that I've defined are listed. And then I get these little arrows to indicate a satisfied by relationship. So microwave oven is associated with the overall system. And as the, the dotted arrows show, associated with the others. And so on. RF power source satisfies the requirement to generate RF power. The dum the dum the dum. Uh, again, this can be very convenient. For example, if I have a real example of this, uh, I can do two things. I can take a requirement and verify that that it's been accounted for in the design. In other words, we've included system elements that are going to satisfy that requirement. But I can also go horizontally. If I have a block that doesn't have any allocation arrows, and in this simple little example. Uh, this isn't nearly complete. This one would, would look like it didn't. It actually does. Um, then that could tell me 
that I've put something in my system design that isn't ju that isn't justified by the requirements I'm trying to satisfy. So you can get a lot of a lot of good information out of this uh, this kind of display of, of model content. Okay, uh, let's switch gears and talk system structure. So we're back to having box. Uh, let me just make sure nobody has put anything in the chat room. I'm not good about that. Hmm. I lost my chat. Dr. Borky, there yes, are a few questions. I don't know if you wanted to address some of them now or yeah, let's let's later. let's do let's do it before they get stale. So if we go back just a little bit, Frank Purdy um, was just had a question uh, in correlation to page eight um, on your thing of MBS AP mapped to the SEV. Yes. This question comes in of how would you use this process to improve the software accreditation for ATO <laughs> decisions? I have a doctoral student writing a dissertation on exactly that subject. But I'll give you the brief answer. Uh, once I have modeled, you need two models. Once I have modeled a representative system and the ATO process. SysML is just as good for modeling and optimizing processes as it is for optimizing systems. So once I have those two models, now I can begin to do behavioral and other simulations. I can trace requirements. I can look for opportunities to automate what are currently manual steps. But most importantly, out of the model, I can create the data package that the decision authority has to see in order to approve or disapprove an ATO. So it's, a it's not a matter of doing the ATO, it's a matter of, of, of refining and then supporting the ATO process using the tools and content of the model. Hope that, hope that does it. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Okay. Uh, I have another question here from Mark Linderman, and this is gonna be on your requirements off of page 12. Okay. So Mark has a, um, a statement and then a question to follow up. So he tried to buy Cameo from Desalt Systems. Uh, they would not return his calls and their website is primitive. It also mm. appears to be really expensive, but how to know, we can't get a quote from them. Thoughts on Sparks that appears to be much cheaper and easier to engage. And um, do the requirements break down relate to a more traditional WBS? Well, they can, certainly. I mean, they, if, you, if you are required to have a WBS, and you typically will be because you're going to be doing earned value, certainly there has to be consistency. Um, but you have to know which requirements are going to be satisfied in which development sprint and so on. To, to the tools, <clears throat> I was worried that this was going to happen. The last time I bought um, Cameo, we bought a pool of floating licenses for the systems engineering department at Colorado State. Um, the price was competitive and they were very easy to deal with. So it sounds like um, they may have been captured by Dassault and lost the, it was a veteran owned small business when No Magic was first incorporated. Um, and they were very easy to deal with. They even had an academic initiative that students could get a, an academic license at no cost. Um, that's what we used to use in our classes. Um, so I don't know how to answer your question. I have not engaged with, uh, with No Magic for quite some time. But I will say one more thing. The first tool I used was Enterprise Architect from Sparks, and um, and I and I loved it. Um, I agreed that it's easy to use. Uh, Sparks probably has the best online tutorial materials of any of the tool vendors that I have seen, for example. So I, I, I I'm prepared to believe that you had the experience that you had. Too bad. Um, I, I've been using this one because it's available to me and it, it, at no cost. Thank okay. you. I have an, an internal question here from um, a gentleman, Dr. Hansen, who's at the Innovari Advancement Center in house with us. He would like to know, how do we know 750 watts is the correct power? Uh, it's a standard. There, I believe there are two standard uh, power levels for the magnetrons that are used in, in home kitchen microwaves. And I happen to know that one of them is 750 watts because I once had to replace one. <laughs> 
All right, wonderful. And I've got one more coming in. Uh, this is from William Stevers. Uh, he says, I know nothing about Cameo. Is this what the final diagram will look like? Or is there another method for generating a more report friendly chart? Well, um, what you do, I, I have skipped over a very important point. And it's one that, that too many people do skip over. So it's worth dwelling on for a moment. A properly defined and documented SysML model is more than diagrams. Uh, what I taught my students was every system element, a block, a relationship, a test case, a dependency, has to be supported by an element specification. And the tool gives you windows in which to, to uh, conveniently do that documenting. Once that content is in, most of the tools that I'm familiar with have some kind of reporting utility. Um, I forget what it's called in, in, uh, in Cameo, but Report Wizard, I think it is. Um, anyway, <clears throat> you have to develop a template, but, but the template then will extract whatever information you specify from the model, format it, Cameo does it as a Word document, and spit it out as a report. And the best data point I have for that, I taught a couple of short courses at NASA Goddard. And for one of them, we had one of their engineers develop the appropriate template. It, it, there's a bit of a learning curve associated with it, freely confess. Um, but I was able in real time during the class to click a couple of buttons and generate an 80 plus page CONOPS document that was conf that conformed to the specification and, and uh, 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 the, the layout uh, that, that the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook calls for. So, um, you know, you, you, you can generate this information. Much of it can be generated by going to tables and then exporting spreadsheets. That's what you'd like. Um, but more commonly, you print out reports with the documentation that lies behind or underneath. I'm, I'll show you an example a little bit later that lies behind or underneath any of these model elements. One of the cultural challenges, by the way, uh, is to teach people <clears throat> just enough that they can read a SysML diagram when it's up on the screen during a program review. That's a real challenge. Thank you very much. And just to give you a, a time update, we are at 12.15. Uh, for folks that do need to drop off at 12.30, you're more than welcome to. Dr. Borky um, is kind enough to stay on the line and continue with his presentation. So we have this line open till 1 p.m. If anybody would just like to stay and listen um, and ask questions past that 1230 mark. Okay. I've delivered much of my message and I'm going to speed up a little bit now. This is a block definition diagram. There are two kinds of block diagrams. I'll show you both of them. Uh, and this is how I fundamentally show, define the elements of the system and show structural decomposition. But I can also show inheritance. Uh, here is a top level block. It's labeled block, so I know it's structure. It's labeled abstract, which tells me it's never directly instantiated, and it's at the level of a system, and I've called it appliance. Now, this one has some value properties. What's, what's argued here is that any appliance is going to have common information about it, such as what type, that's an enumerated list, who manufactured it, another enumerated list, uh, the model number, which is just an alphanumeric string, and the line voltage that it works off of. Uh, this diamond or triangular, it's not a diamond, it's a triangular arrowhead is the inheritance. Going upward, it's generalization. Going downward, it's inheritance. What it signifies is that the block on the other end of one of these lines inherits all of the characteristics of the parent block above it. So this microwave oven block which is the microwave oven block that we saw in an earlier requirements diagram, um, has all of these, these value properties. And I've also then separately defined the parts that it has, the power source, control, electronics, and supply. Just for, for completeness, I said an appliance could also be a refrigerator or a dishwasher, or I could have continued it. Um, all of them would have had, as, as is explicitly shown here, the inherited values that came down from, from above. So these are blocks in an inheritance uh, relationship. That's one of the central principles of object orientation. Here is a, a different block definition diagram. And now instead of an inheritance arrow, I know this is a little uh, pixelated, but that's supposed to be a filled in or black diamond. That is the composition relationship. And that says 
that the blocks down here on the other end of these arrows are parts of the parent block, <clears throat> parent block above. So the microwave oven is a system, and it's made up of four domains, four next first or next level of decomposition. Uh, and those are a control electronics block, a power source, an enclosure, and a control panel. And I can define part properties, value properties, and operations are some of the more common characteristics that I define for a block. Here is that promised element specification. Um, and you put this information in. Um, it can include uh, free text if you want to put in something that isn't one of the defined, predefined elements of the, uh, of the specification template. And this tells you everything you need to know about a particular block and where it is and who owns it and what requirements it satisfies and everything else. So to the question about can I spit this out in a more report-like format, this is the kind of content that you would generate. Um, I can continue the decomposition. Oops. If I take this control electronics block and decompose it to the next level, which I've stereotyped as a component, I'm saying it's made up of some kind of data processor, a five volt power supply, and a Wi Fi transceiver. And now I can begin to actually put in part properties like actual model numbers uh, or, or the values of variables and such. Um, so you, you get the idea that these, no, these little numbers are called cardinalities and they tell me how many instances of the child block are contained in the control electronics block. And a common way that's shown is to, to do a vehicle. One of the part properties of the vehicle is a tire or a wheel, uh, but it has a cardinality of four. Now, the other kind of block diagram is intended to show interactions. The block definition diagram shows structure and decomposition. In the IBD, the internal block diagram, shows how things talk to each other. So here's my control electronics, and it's interacting with control panel, the enclosure, and the magnetron, the power source. It's also interacting with the outside world via Wi-Fi. So I've got these flow arrows, which are labeled with what's flowing. I've got uh, these... Uh, little squares, which is the SysML symbol for a port where an interface is implemented. And I've got these funky lollipop and socket symbols, which are, which declare the interface or interfaces that are associated with the port. So this is a very compact way of, of displaying uh, what is exchanged between the elements of the system and between the system and the outside world. Um, this uh, little pitchfork symbol uh, the tool automatically puts in to tell me that there is a more detailed diagram or an associated diagram embedded within this block. Uh, here's another one, an IBD. This time, uh, what I'm showing is that the processor uh, interacts with the control panel via a pair of ports with a pair of flow arrows, and it interacts with a safety device, the latch switch, which tells me whether or not the door is latched shut. That's how I implement the enclosure safety function. It gets five, both the uh, processor and the Wi-Fi get five volts of power from the power supply. And this is exactly the same as it was on the previous diagram. The, the idea here is I'm trying to give you the sense that you display on a given diagram that detail which you are trying to communicate. And you can suppress details if they're not important for the purpose for which you are producing or using the diagram. Back to tables. Uh, one of the really neat features of Cameo is that once you have defined all this stuff, it will automatically generate interface control documents. Now, these are typically agonizing, manual, man-hour intensive uh, things to produce, and they're prone to, prone to mistakes. Um, I think it's a great advantage to be able to get them spat out directly by the modeling tool. You can make almost anything into a table. Uh, there's actually a model element in the tool called a generic table. So I can list stuff and whatever content yeah, I have placed into the model can be pulled up and placed in an appropriate column associated with each of these. Okay, so it's the exact same information, just a different way of showing it. I made a big fuss about data modeling, so let me just show you a simple example. Uh, in MBSAP, data modeling begins with something called a foundation class. And a foundation class, once again, is abstract. It's completely general. It's never actually part of a database. 
um, but it defines critical characteristics of all of the actual data elements that inherit from it. So this is stereotype block. Info, info element is the stereotype I use to identify that something is an element of a data model. And this is taking the, the overall foundation class and breaking it down into control data, operational data, and maintenance data. The logical data model would take those, those uh, high-level blocks and define them more precisely. So for example, uh, in the control data block, I'm going to inherit to a power value and a time value. Um, and those are ultimately going to derive from the, from the control panel. Uh, but all I'm doing here is, is um, successively decomposing the structure, including in the data model, and in the process inheriting characteristics from a higher level element that are to be applied to a lower level. Okay, that was a quick trip through structure. Let's talk briefly about behavior. Uh, behavior tends to start with use cases, and there are a lot of people in the world who think they know what a use case is, and most of them are wrong. But um, fundamentally, a use case is a way to define a coherent increment of system functionality or behavior. There are two for this simple example, do the cooking and perform occasional maintenance and repair. They can be decomposed into lower level use cases using what's called an include dependency. And they can be associated with system users or other external entities, which are modeled as actors. This little stick figure uh, is, the, is what I use to model anything, a person, a network, an external facility, anything that's outside the boundary of my system that I have to talk to uh, gets captured as an actor. And then in several of these cases, I have embedded behavior diagrams. We'll get to one of those in a minute. Uh, here's another element specification. In terms of scenario, it looks like a lot like the block spec that we saw before, but this happens to be a, um, uh, the element specification for a use case. And this is what's called an activity diagram. Anybody that's ever drawn a flow chart is probably comfortable with this kind of, of a diagram, but there's a great power here, and it is that this kind of diagram can link structure and behavior together. So the so-called swim lanes, everybody calls them that because this looks like a swimming pool, are defined, allocated to uh, the structural elements, the same ones, control panel, electronics, enclosure, and power source. But what's inside them are actions and decisions and other kinds of behavioral elements that are carried out by or owned by the associated structural element. So this is how I define the specific behaviors that are implemented in any given structural element. And so the flow here is, is familiar to anybody that's ever used one of these. You put in time and power. Um, that sets a couple of values. You press the start button. The interlock voltage together with that gets sent to, to the enclosure, which sets the discrete to lock the door. Check whether the door is locked. If it is, the control electronics sends the appropriate signal to the magnetron and we generate RF power for the specified time. So dead simple, but, but a very, um, again, compact and very informative way to show a behavior. And this is the kind of diagram that can be simulated in the tool directly. Uh, here's another simple one. This, this is just linear. These are the steps in controlling power. But notice this, these actions are associated with use cases. If I went back to my use case diagram and we looked at these numbers, you would see that each of these actions is, is the behavior that is defined in that use case. Here's a little more complicated one that has the ability to use uh, activity nodes to bring in or send out uh, values. So here where I'm controlling our power generation, this behavior gets a power value and a time value. We saw those earlier and then it does its thing so the timer counts down to zero and it turns the magnetron back on. Another kind of behavior diagram is the state machine. These tend to be familiar to software engineers, but they're incredibly powerful in, um, in general systems engineering in behavior modeling. The system can either be off, it can be in a state where the control panel is being used to input variables like time and power, um, or it can be in a state where it's doing cooking. And it transitions between these states via these transition arrows, which can be uh, controlled by triggers, by conditions that must be satisfied, and so forth. 
So this this tells me uh, an, an important element of this, of the microwave uh, oven's behavior, but now in a stateful form. Uh, what configure what behavioral configuration is it in at any given time? And the final type of behavior diagram that we use a lot is the sequence diagram. Sequence diagrams are message oriented. Once again, I have these vertical lines. Now they're called lifelines rather than swim lines. At the head of each one is one of our four structural elements and time goes from top to bottom. And what happens is a sequence of messages, sometimes they're self messages, are sent. Uh, and, the, and I can put in subtleties like a loop. This, uh, this uh, uh, little sub frame here, it's called a fragment, says that um, as long as the timer is less than or equal to the time value that was inputted, I'm going to loop through this set of messages. I'm going to control the voltage and generate RF power. And then when the timer expires, I'm going to remove the interlock voltage and unlock the door. Uh, depending on exactly which behavior and exactly which uh, behavioral analysis I'm doing, one or another of these behavior diagram types is likely to be most convenient. And this can also be directly simulated. Uh, kind of a funky little diagram that has nothing on it but actors. Uh, I, I just threw this in because uh, I find it useful to define the actual external entities coherently in one place, and then I can drag them into whatever other diagrams I need them for. Okay, one more type of diagram, parametric. Uh, this is how I put in equations. This is something that SysML has that UML simply does not. It is the ability to do computations. I have to define something called a constraint block all right, and then I put in, in, in a constraint, I mean, I'm in a uh, constraint. This is not a constraint block. It doesn't have square corners. It is a constraint. This is where I define the equation. And then what happens is the variables are fetched from wherever in the model database they are stored. The equation is evaluated and an answer is produced and put out. Um, a very important feature of these is that if I need to do computations that are mathematically more sophisticated, more complex than the built-in arithmetic of the tool can handle, parametric diagrams can be linked to external solvers. A very common linkage is to um, MATLAB, but, uh, but lots of external tools. Uh, um, Model Center has been, been automatically linked to it, for example. All right, I'm done. And I almost made it on the hour. Here's, here's my key message. I assert that MBSE is the current state of the art or state of the practice um, for a lot of reasons that I talked about in the first half of the hour. We can, we can do a better job of balancing the satisfaction of diverse stakeholder concerns and they are always in conflict with each other. That's what I consider is a balanced design. Um, we can make the system engineering process itself uh, more productive and higher quality, fewer mistakes, fewer latent errors. Um, one of the big productivity improvements is simply in automatically generating documents that someone else, someone would otherwise have to sit down to a word processor and create, um, or, or uh, turning diagrams into view graphs to support a, uh, support a presentation or a program review. I'm really sold on the better requirements engineering that you can do here and the long-term uh, governance of the system using quality attributes. So, uh, MBSAP is not unique. There are lots of methodologies out there. The only claim I make for it is that I've used it a lot of times in a lot of different circumstances and it works. It does comply with leading government and, and uh, industry frameworks. For example, ISO 42010. Uh, it's been applied successfully by hundreds of students and by myself personally on real programs such as at NASA. Um, and it works. And it is, I, I think now documented and it is supported by a variety of tools and I believe ready for, for implementation. So um, that's, my, that's my opening shot. If we, if we decide to, um, to continue this dialogue about possibly doing MBSE more, uh, more intensively. And um, are there any final questions? Thank you, Dr. Borky. Currently, there's no questions in our chat box. If anybody has one that they'd like to unmute themselves and ask Dr. Borky, feel free. I will take this 
moment just to let everybody know that this recording will be available within the next 24 to 48 hours on Griffiths Institute's YouTube channel. You'll be able to find it on the playlist under the Innovari Elevation Series. In addition, a direct link will be sent to all that have registered and attended today for that series. If you are looking to get a hold of Dr. Borky, um, I know that we had Frank Purdy uh, would like to go ahead and direct some individuals to yourself uh, regarding ATO, Dr. Borky. So feel free to reach out to um, Dr. Borky at mike.borky at c-o-l-o state.edu and he can go ahead and be connected that way. Um, at this time, I thank everybody for attending our Lunch and Learn with Dr. Borky. Dr. Borky, thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to go ahead and present the overview on MBSE. Uh, we do have our next Innovari Elevation Series coming up in two weeks uh, with an in-person presentation on what's in your way. If anybody's interested, a link will be sent out on that. Um, so thank you all. I will go ahead and give uh, anybody that's still in attendance the opportunity to ask direct questions. Thank you.